What's going on everyone and welcome to Method in the Madness and this is the podcast that not only delves deep into design and creativity but also leadership, productivity and personal development. And this is episode 17 and for this one I hit the road and I drove all the way down to Silverstone Racing Circuit, the home of British motorsport, where I got to sit down with Abby Eaton and... Uh, for those of you who don't know, Abby is a professional racing driver and performance driving coach who is a multiple British champion in a numerous different series. And she was also the first female to ever win the Block Pan Endurance Series that almost had little to zero preparation for either, which is completely nuts when you hear about it. But uh, she also has appeared on TV shows such as ITV's Drive, where she coached Professor Green to success. But more notably, You may know Abby from being the test driver on Amazon's The Grand Tour uh, for the past couple of seasons alongside Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and James May. And Abby and I basically chat all things motorsport, you know, how she was first introduced to motor racing and how she kind of got into it. The preparation involved as well as the demands involved, both physically and mentally. And we chat about a whole bunch of other stuff, including, you know, her upcoming season in the W Series, uh, which is the all-female Formula 3 racing championship, which should be fun to watch this year on Channel 4 if you want to tune in. And personally, this has been one of my favorite episodes, not only because it's motorsport related and I am really into motorsport, but I think a lot of people are going to be pretty surprised as well as fascinated to hear how the motor racing industry actually operates and just how much work is involved in what goes into life inside the motor racing world. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Dinghy. And what is Dinghy? Dinghy is insurance for freelancers by freelancers, and they are on a mission to make insurance cheaper, faster, and most importantly, fairer. They have a groundbreaking approach which offers flexible pay-as-you-go business insurance exclusively for freelancers, which is all done through their simple and very cool app. And with that, you get insurance that can be turned up or down. You can turn it on or off 24-7, meaning you you only actually pay for the coverage you need. It is charged down to the second, then you get billed in arrears. There's no fees or admin charges ever, and you can get a quote in 40 seconds, and you can have your policy set up and ready to go within two minutes by only answering eight questions, which is pretty awesome. I mean, two minutes is absolutely nothing. And their insurance is not only tailored specifically for freelancers, but Dinghy also support a wide variety of freelancer groups and they also support charities with the aim of improving freelancing and the world in general. So visit the following link today and get your quote in seconds. So head over to getdinghy.com forward slash M-I-T-M. That's G-E-T-D-I-N-G-H-Y dot com forward slash M-I-T-M. It's an amazing service, and like I keep saying, it's not just for creatives. If you are, you know, an app developer, if you're a podcaster, if you're a mural artist, you can all get covered. So by all means, head over and check it out. But without much further ado, please welcome Abby Eaton to Method in the Madness. Abby, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and nonetheless inviting me down to the home of British Motor Racing, Silverstone. Uh, How are you getting on? Oh, good. I just wish the weather was a little bit nicer. Yeah. Um, I guess in Scotland, it's probably similar. I'll probably a little bit colder, actually. It was was a lot colder this morning when I left, that's for certain. Yeah. Uh, A lot darker as well, but that's just Scotland for you. So, but uh, yeah, it was pissing with rain. So, well, not, yes, not too dissimilar no, to down here. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Silverstone's weird when it's empty. I've only ever been here when there's a, like an event going on. It's mm. a bit eerie when there's like no humans around no. or cars going around the track. For me, it's it's weird when it's busy because <laughs> I always see it when it's like this. So, like when you come to an F1 meeting and there's people everywhere, it just it looks like a completely different place. Yeah. And obviously, you know, they're, they're building a new hotel here and stuff like that. So, each time I come back, like it's completely different. It probably takes you ages to get to building to building as it, well Well, for now yeah once <laughs> they actually finish the hotel it'll be quicker to get in but otherwise you've got to drive around the um outside of the full track so yeah, yeah it is what it is uh for listeners who don't know you are a professional racing driver um multiple british champion in series such as like the mx5 super cup and 
production touring car championship and you were also the first woman to win the blog pan endurance series you have also appeared on tv shows like itv's drive alongside professor green blast from the past yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh to which you were successful obviously yes uh yes. and also uh most notably the test driver on amazon's the grand tour alongside clarkson hammond and may um but you were introduced to motorsport at an incredibly young age uh, as most people in the sport are um by your father who's also involved in racing but could you tell us a bit about some of your earliest memories of motorsport and the kind of can you remember the first time you got behind the wheel um so my well earliest memories i probably don't even remember so i was at a track when i was like two months old so oh, wow. um yeah literally growing up at the race circuits around the uk and you know, I was always out on my push bike, you know, creating havoc. And, you know, back <laughs> in those days, the kids were kind of free to just go and entertain themselves. And, you know, someone from each team would have an eye on where the kids were or where the other team's kids were. So, you know, it was a really good childhood to kind of grow up in, in that atmosphere. And, you know, I was always watching what was going on and watching my dad race. And it was something that I've always wanted to do. And probably my earliest kind of memory of... um trying to get budget together was when my dad was racing at Knock Hill oh, in wow. Scotland and um represent yeah, they, Knock have, Hill. That's it. <laughs> they have obviously the cart track up there and yeah. I remember um saying oh I really want to go karting dad you know can I can I go and obviously he's really busy you know racing and running the corporate hospitality and all that stuff and you know it was no no we haven't got time or I think the excuse was we haven't got the money it's too expensive or it's so probably I, pissing down the rain yeah, no, I, I, I've I only been it was there, really nice it was really sunny I've only been there twice where it's been sunny in yeah. my entire life but I was just lucky then obviously yeah. <laughs> and um so what I did is I went and rummaged in the back of a the truck and found like a little cardboard box and I basically cut a little coin slot out the top of it and I went round all the teams and basically said, my mum and dad won't pay for me to go karting. You know, <laughs> can you can you um, donate to my karting fund? And obviously everyone did and they laughed about it and gave me the money. So I got back to the tr uh, truck and I was like, look, mum, I've, you know, I've raised some money to go karting. And obviously my mum and dad are absolutely mortified. Yeah, I'd basically just gone begging. Yeah, poverty around the panic. And um, <laughs> made me go and take it back to everyone and obviously no one would get, take the money back and that kind of stuff. And the next morning, in the driver's briefing one of the the drivers had said you know i just want to make a complaint that drivers are sending their young children out to get next year's budget and stuff <laughs> like that so yeah there was a joke on my my dad there for a while but you know it just shows that i wanted to do it in any way that mm. i could and you know i was i think i was probably seven at the time something like that um so yeah the the hunger was there from a very early age yeah it's a good carton track there it's one of the i've things. never still never been around it all right no. it's just because it's an outdoor one the rest mm. of them in scotland tend to be indoor and like yeah. super tight while well, that one you can actually overtake quite yeah. a lot on it and things yeah. like that. but like it's kind of the same like dad marshals at knock hill occasionally and whenever it was his turn to look after the kids at the weekend my brother and i got dragged along and it'd just be like right i'm going to be over here yeah you know with the rescue unit just go and amuse yourselves so yeah. we used to go and don't get run over well yeah like you think you go into like they used to have like a like a castle for like paintball in, in the middle of the track and, yeah. and just go and dick around on that for mm. four hours while dad watches gt3 cars going in the track yeah. but it's uh, crazy to think gt3 is going around knock hill now well yeah i mean yeah it's kind of changed over the years that's mm. for certain but yeah it's such a kind of it's a very odd track it's good like everyone you ask any driver in the uk that's been around it and you know it's a wicked little track and i actually only experienced it going the opposite direction last year All right. and um i think it's god that would probably be quite weird i, I think i prefer it going the, the wrong way around because you'd be coming up you go, dip. yeah and you go down the chicken yeah but like as opposed to coming up over the blind um top the other way you actually yeah. come down and it drops away from you it's yeah. interesting yeah oh well I've never, I've never seen that before. Mm. They do that quite often. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Some um, races they run one day in one direction and the next day in the other direction. All ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Never done that. Learn something new every day. <laughs> uh, I read recently in, uh, I think it was the Times article where you you said when you were young you'd see like your friends swooning over Nirvana CDs and dvd box sets of other kind of things and you know you were just spent your weekends kind of wanting to do things with cars and kind of motor racing was that ever kind of hard having an interest in a sport that's not probably especially for females probably not a common sport to kind of be involved with 
And did you or did you have plate of friends who were also into it, or did it just not really bother you? I don't know, really. I just didn't really, I didn't really think about it as being different. Um, you know, I would have my weekends with my family and going and being, you know, immersed in motorsport. And even during the week, you know, I'd do my homework and then I'd go and sit in the garage with my dad, and he'd be working on the car, and I'd be like, you know chopping something up with something in a vice and sawing away at it or you know so I was it was just felt natural I never felt kind of alienated or different or anything like that because obviously when you go to school then you're playing football you play the normal sport so it was just I guess probably that other kids maybe thought it was different or a little bit yeah, weird suppose, yeah. um, but for me <laughs> just I was normal just, for you yeah just happy as Larry getting on with it yeah quite right uh you've raced in a whole bunch of kind of different series you know, touring cars, uh, MX5, obviously, Rallycross. Last weekend, you're doing the Jaguar I-Pace as well. Um, what's the preparation like for any race and how does it differ depending on what series you're getting into? Um, Kind of the, the same process, no matter what you're in. Um, You know, the week before, obviously, you're thinking about your, well, long before that, you're thinking about your training, which is just a constant thing. But in the week before, you obviously, you wash your kit, you get everything sorted, you make sure you've got, maybe if you've not been to a new circuit before, you've you've got the circuit in your head, you've learned, you know, written notes on it from maybe onboard footage or, you know, practicing it on the simulator and that kind of stuff. Um, But I think the most important thing in the run up to it is, is, like preparing your body so sleep having enough sleep if you can yeah. um but it's just different processes for for different kind of um situations so for example when i did the blanc pan race at monza it was all so new to me i'd never raced a gt3 before i'd never been to monza yeah. and uh you know to well. a really cool circuit um but to be out on a grid of like 52 cars and you know <laughs> i was so unprepared i'd not done any testing or anything like that and the week before I was shitting myself I was just thinking (laughs) what have I done like I've got so much to to try and you know learn in a quick space of time and you know I don't want to throw it off I want to bring it back in one piece but ultimately I know I'm I'm a quick driver but you know you can't just jump in a car and do it straight away you you have to give yourself the time to acclimatize and I just didn't want to mess up basically and the week before I just remember feeling really anxious and ill and I was like oh why am I putting myself through this (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then at the end, when we ended up winning, I was like, oh, okay, this feels quite nice now. And, you know, all the stress of the week before, you kind of think, well, it was all worth it to get to this point. Um, but when you're doing a full season of something, you know, your head's in the game a bit more. You, you know, well, by it's midway. It's complete immersion in it, yeah, in it yeah. isn't it? Rather and by midway through the season, you actually know what the car does and what it likes and what it doesn't mm-hmm. like. But, you know, I'm not from a wealthy background, so the last full season of racing I did was 2016 and from then I've had the odd race here and there and you you jump in and have these guest drives which is you know obviously the fantastic opportunities that I'm given but you have to learn pretty fast and um the process to to do that can sometimes not be as enjoyable as if you have a full season of something because you just end up I'm very hard on myself and I end up putting too much pressure on myself and you know I've I've kind of been in the on in the top three of everything I've ever raced and you kind of I want to keep that up yeah. and you know <laughs> sometimes reasons. you know sometimes it's it's a lot to ask uh you know W series for example next year you know I've not raced a single seater before I've done literally mm. three days in a single seater and now I'm jumping into a grid next year where the entire grid have either raced single seaters previously or they've done W series last wow. year so um and do you get like a like so you, you mentioned kind of like the simulator and things like that there like how I've never had like other than like ones in an arcade, which is yeah. not a simulator; it's a game. Mm. But like, how close to the real experience does that does that translate pretty well? It must do. Um, but... Yeah, there are some that are better than others. Um, the W Series simulators they use Pro Sims, which they're brilliant. Mm. Um, I've kind of not really been into simulators. I don't really feel like they're very realistic, and I don't feel other than learning a circuit that they don't prepare you enough. Right. But once I jumped on these sims, you know, they are very, very useful. And I'd say probably the, one of the most realistic sims that I've been on. Um, so that is really all I can do in prep for next year um, is just to try and be on the sim all the time, you know, learn the new circuits. Obviously, fitness is important. So anything that I ha- have control of bettering, I will try and do. But, 
you know, to test a single seater is like six to eight grand just for one day. And I haven't got that kind of money. Um, you know, the girls that have raced W Series. <laughs> Not many people do. No, no. <laughs> you know, the girls that have been in the series for the year, they know the cars obviously a bit better than me. And, you know, with the winnings that they've had, they're able to now do some testing, which, you know, is testament to W Series for providing them with the opportunity. Mm. And for them to be brave enough to have said yes for the first year, you know, ultimately I had the opportunity to do it and I said no. So it's only myself that's that's put me in this little bit tougher position. But, you know, the first year I want to be in the top 10, finish in the top 10, um, you know, towards the sharper end if I can. And then come back the next year and, you know, learn a little bit more and, mm. and hopefully, you know, be challenging for the title. Yeah. So going back to the, the blog pan race in Monza. Like, how did that opportunity come around since it was just like, you know, you hadn't been preparing for it as much yeah. as you'd hoped and things like that? Was it just like, did someone pull out? Or like, what, what happened for that to kind of all come together? Um, There was a guy who basically wanted to have, I wanted to do something different and wanted to have a female to race with him. Um, And so he basically had a shootout. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh my goodness, a girl. Um, So there was a shootout between me and two of the girls. And... um. You know, one of the, the the other two had raced GT3s before and one of them had raced that car for like a couple of years. And, oh, wow. um, you know, I'd never driven a, a GT3 or anything as fast as that ever. And I'd never been at Monza. So I rocked up to the shootout, you know, thinking, right, OK, I've got nothing to lose here. Um, I'm going to just try and give it my all. But I've always been the same that if I ever do a test day or anything, the first session I go out, I'll kind of be average and i'll get to a certain time and then i won't go any quicker i need to come in stop have a chat have a little sit and then go back out and i will immediately find a load of time and so it was a two-day test for this blanc pan race and um i went out in the morning of day one was pretty average um came in and i'm thinking right okay cool you know i've shaken that off mm. you know it's fucking fast um <laughs> you know the track so is i think in terms of just to paint a picture for the listeners like how fast are we talking um, I think I'm just trying to think the speed of those. I think they're like 500 brakes, something like that. Jesus. Um, That's I can't crazy. remember because I raced the challenge car and that was like 600 odd. Um, Bloody hell. But yeah, pretty quick, yeah. quick <laughs> enough to like push you back in the seat. Um, and Monza is you know really really long straights and really mm. hard braking zones. You know, be going from flat out in sixth gear to first gear chicane. Yeah. So it's a pretty daunting track to get your head stuck into and. Um, yeah, the first time I went round it, you know, I'm like, right, okay, survive, didn't die, you know, <laughs> got that in my head. So next time I go out, and we'll go a bit quicker. But I ended up not being allowed back in the car for the rest of the day, and I was like, right, okay, maybe they're just going to put me in tomorrow. And at the end of day one, one of the girls got sent home, so it was just me and this other girl. And then for the next day, the other girl was just in the car all the time, and. I was like, well, it's obvious that they've chosen her, which yeah. is fine, you know. She was quick, you know, absolutely fine. But just tell me so I can go home <laughs> rather than being stood in this cold garage all day, you know, getting more and more pissed off. Um, and at the end of the day, it was like 5 p.m. And they were like, right, okay, you can go in the car now if you want. So I was like, right, you know, F you basically. Yeah. Well, I, this car's having it. Hold so, my beer. <laughs> yeah, I jumped in <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely thrashed it and ended up being quicker than the other girl. And, you know, they were all like, oh, why didn't you tell us you could drive like that? And I'm like, you didn't give me the opportunity. You know, yeah. it's a new car, a new track. Like, I have to acclimatize. Um, and then they put some new tires on and I had to basically get to this time. And if you do, then, you know, we'll see what happens. And, you know, eventually I did get down to this time that they wanted me at and then I got the drive. But um, that was basically the only testing, if you like, that I had before this Blanc Prime race was, you know, two 20-minute runs in the car at this track. So... Jesus. Yeah, it it was. How long's the race? Uh, it was a three hour race, but it's split between three drivers, so oh. you could do an hour each basically. And I did the middle stint. Yeah, yeah. it's tough though. Like, hmm. you know, I can't compare to driving a GT three car. Obviously, I've only ever driven a car around yeah. Knockhill, but it's like one thing that even when you go go karting, mm. like you're exhausted afterwards because mm. you intense. don't really realize how much adrenaline. How much of the adrenaline dump happens when you stop driving? Yeah, and then like because you're almost just like you're buzzing afterwards because it's still mm. going, and then you like drive home. You get home, and you're like, yeah. I need a wee nap or something like yeah. that, you know? Yeah. But it, 
I don't think people realize is how exhausting driving is. Mm. Oh, it's mentally exhausting as well. And, you know, for me in that Blanc Pan race, because I was, I was almost kind of coaching myself how to drive it, but also trying to race other cars at the same time. And, um, 52, 52 know. cars in the grid. Fucking yeah. Hell, so busy. And, <laughs> like I, in the end, my race pace was all right. Like, you know, it was only a few tenths that I was off and I was really pleased with how I'd performed. Um, uh, but I just wanted to enjoy it. And because you're so out of your comfort zone and you're so, you know, trying to push yourself, but also bring it home in one piece, mm. it's a bit of a stressful situation to be in. Um, if you did in the full season, then you would, you know, I would have sat down and been like, right, this is amazing. This is sick. Yeah. Um, but that's just what most sports like. Um, you take the opportunities that you're given yeah. and you kind of run with it and <laughs> like, you are right doing this. I'm like, Even yeah, you're going hundreds of miles an hour around the track and like a death machine, yeah. but like, I'm like, yeah, I'll just, work, I'll work it out when I'm going around, you know, <laughs> why not? And like, how fine is the line in a race like that from bringing it home and not bringing it home? Um, you kind of, it depends on the situation. So obviously in those kind of situations where I've been given a one-off drive and, you know, you want to do a good job and if yeah. I crash, they're definitely not going to ask me back. So you kind of <laughs> have to, yeah, just tread it carefully. Um, you know, I had a few moments, sideways moments and stuff like that, but ultimately I probably played it a little bit safe than what I would, what I did. I played it safe oh. in comparison if I was doing a full season. Um, but actually, when you're in a race and you're cracking on, you know, there are, there will always be a couple of moments where you're like, oh, God, all right, I got away with that one. OK, let's crack on again and make sure we don't that, make that same yeah. mistake. So you're always treading the line and that's why you'll see, you know, some it's cars. It's pretty mental, there's 52 cars, though. Mm. When you think of, like, F1 going around that, it seems like a busy track yeah. because of the design of Monza. Yeah. 52 cars. Mm. And you've got cars in front, you know, behind, yeah. side of you, everything. And going through the same corners. Yeah. I think they're what in the same line that you are. And, mm. oh, and you have geez. to work out who's in the car as well. So you'll have some amateur drivers, you'll have some professional drivers. And by looking at the kind of, um, like, behavior of the car, you tend to work out who's mm. in it. Um, you know, Joe Osborne, for example, um, a McLaren factory driver, I always know when he's driving a car because, like, if there's half a gap or if I think he might, be trying to overtake he will mm. and it's the same as when i raced against him in british gt you know i'm in gt4 which is the slower class and he's in gt3 um so his car and uh is usually you know 10 seconds yeah. a lap quicker and i know when he's coming up behind me that he will lunge me even if there's no gap he's going to go past me and it's just knowing that from each of the drivers and and that's when you, you you're able to bring the car home in one piece whereas some amateur drivers might not look at that and they yeah. might just think, oh, well, he's not going to overtake me there. Gap, when, yeah. And that's when you have a collision. Oh, God. Uh, stressful. Yeah. <laughs> just talking about it. <laughs> if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah, yeah. Like, talking about that, like, you know, I remember when I used to watch like WRC when I was a kid. Um, whatever happened to televised WRC? Mm. It used to be on, like, telly all the time when I was a yeah. kid. Anyway, we used to see, like, Carlos Sands, like, going around and you could see this the grimace in his face like he was obviously quite famous for that i suppose and i've watched several videos of you racing and it looks like you're out for like a sunday stroll <laughs> like you just look like there's almost no expression you wouldn't know what's happening on the outside of the car judging by the look on your face mm. do you have to get yourself in like a specific mindset before you start driving or you know are you at kind of peace behind the wheel or do you just give that illusion <laughs> Um, again, I think it depends what the situation is. Um, for example, the Jag um, I-Pace race that I did at the weekend, on one of it, uh, the races, the, oh, the qualifying was at like half seven in the morning. And obviously yeah. the time difference is it's three only three hours, but it's basically like we were out in qualifying at like four in the morning. So I was pretty tired and pretty <laughs> asleep. Um, so you just, I had to just like G myself up and just be like, come on, like get yeah. get on it. Like, you know. I would have probably had a Red Bull or something like that, but they didn't have any out there. So I was just smashing <laughs> smashing the cups of tea down. Um, and, you know, sometimes you do have to G yourself up in that situation. But once you actually get in a race um, mode, you, you're just so focused on what you're doing and, you know, not making a mistake. And um, autopilot kind of kicks it in. It totally is autopilot. Um, not so much the guest drives, you kind of thinking yeah. all the time but um yeah when you're in a full season of something it's yeah autopilot and you just get on with it and, and whatever you're presented with you just deal with yeah could you tell us a bit about you know how what's 
going through your mind and how do you feel when you're actually out on track during a race? And, you know, I remember, I think it was when Sky Sports for Scott F1, and I, I don't know if it's embellished a little bit, but like it's one of these things where, you know, they were measuring Lewis Hamilton's heart rate when he's sitting at the lights and it's like sky high. Mm. And then once by like lap five, it's almost down at resting pace, despite obviously they're doing eye tracking and things like that and his mm. eyes are all over the shop and he's obviously concentrated. Do you get calm like throughout a race? Like, you know, mm. how do you, what's going through your head when you're out there? I think um, like at the start, everyone will always have the adrenaline. And mm. honestly, it's the, I think it's the worst feeling in the world because you sat there and you've got all this like anxiety and you're just thinking, right, this is, especially if you're doing a standing start, you know, mm. I've got to get this right because if I don't, I'm going to lose X amount of places or yeah. I might stall or I lose the lead. And, you know, you're looking at these lights and it's a reaction test ultimately. And you're like, you know, you've, you've got to do it right. And is my biting point right? And all that yeah. stuff. So you're like, <laughs> your heart don't is up, going, don't fuck yeah, up, don't yeah. fuck up. Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Your heart is going mental and like, I was saying to one of my other friends, I'm like, do you like hate it? Do you sit there and think, why am I doing this? She's like, yeah, every time. <laughs> you sit there and you're like, this is just an awful feeling. But as soon as you go, that's it. And you, you're just in complete focus mode and you don't think about anything. Um, if you, or I think if I start to think about stuff, like if I'm leading and I'm like, right, don't fuck this up. You've got one lap left. And then I'll make it, I'll always make tiny, tiny little mistake. I'm like, just stop thinking about shit just get yeah. on with it like just do what you're doing um and it's the moment where you actually are conscious about what you're thinking that's when you're not concentrating yeah um but other than that you're always just in the zone and yeah once you you kind of get the first lap out of the way and you kind of settle into a bit of a, a rhythm and you have maybe a car in front that you're chasing down so you're focused on that or if you have someone behind you that you're trying to keep behind you, you you've got like a, a job in hand that you need to concentrate on mm. and that's all you do and you know to start off with you might be trying to keep this guy behind and then you start to pull a gap and your next job goes to right I'm going to chase that person down and you, you're always focused on something yeah yeah because yeah. like whenever you know obviously I've only ever done track days and karting as like with mates so I've never raced anyone ever in my life because well if you go to a track day you're not an arsehole yeah. like, trying to have a race <laughs> but it's like one of these things where you know you the i don't know if this disappears when you are a professional mm. <laughs> it's basically what i'm asking but you do begin over the course of the day because like at the very start of the day so last time i was around knock hill was in the lotus and you know you start off you know get the tires warm and you get going and then over the day your pace gets better and better and better and like you know like you get the kind of the rub for it so mm. to speak and then you kind of that slight cockiness so you'll i'll break slightly later i'll accelerate slightly quicker yeah and then all of a sudden you have like a the tail kick out or something mm. like that does that kind of cockiness kind of just is that not a factor for professional drivers or is it sometimes um, it just depends on the personality I suppose. it's not it's not cockiness but you have to push it to find the limits and you have to do it to get faster so but it'll be more methodical it won't be like oh, i'm just gonna do it because i'll see what happens it's like <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna try and break you know five meters later here and if i can try and get on the power a bit earlier here then this might happen and i might you know gain something here but if i get on it too fast then i might lose on the way out mm. to my next corner so it's just really methodical about it and um yeah there probably are some drivers that are maybe a little bit cocky but um if you're a professional then it's more you know yeah. you're going through the process of trying to get you know the ultimate lap together really i think there's also another thing that people don't really realize is like when I, you know when i thought right I'm, I'm going i'm pushing myself to the best of my ability in a way i'm not really comfortable if it's someone else's car like that i didn't have to worry about going to a soundtrack but maybe we'd be thinking differently but since yeah. it was my own car <laughs> yeah uh you know you're just like, I'm not comfortable breaking any later and things like that because I don't think it will be able to cope. Mm. But I got taken out in my car by an ex touring car driver. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, like he is breaking like way later than like, you know, you're just judging by like, you know, however many yard signs, you know, yeah. like oh, I'm breaking at the whatever yard sign, he's breaking way past that. And yeah. it's just like, holy shit, like you don't realize like 
how much you can actually push it mm. until you actually get out there with like a professional driver yeah obviously you kind of get into the rhythm and this is what i say to people you know if i take them around here um in the aston martin or something mm. and they're like oh you know my Renault Clio wouldn't be able to to go around the corners like this. And so like, actually, yeah, you'd be no. surprised. You know, the the thing is that people are so used to driving between, you know, 30 and 50, 60 mile an hour on the road that they think that's all that the cars are capable of. Mm. But actually, you can carry 70 mile an hour around a corner if you do it in the right way. Um, and it's just, you know, getting people to realize that as well. Um, yeah, but, I suppose when you're, you know, you're obviously a driving coach as well. And when you are taking people in, it must take them a while to kind of shake the everyday rules that they adhere to off yeah. before they kind of start pushing themselves on track. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens fairly quickly. You kind of make big steps to start off with, but it's the kind of last few tenths that mm. it just, it's people's muscle memory of the car. And if they're not used to a car moving around underneath them, then it's going to feel uncomfortable and they're not going to like it but you just have to chip away at them and get them comfortable to that bit it's just yeah you get to this level and you tick it off you think right okay i'm comfortable with how that moves now i know that when it does this this is going to happen blah 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 so then you go a little bit faster and the car will move a little bit quicker and it's just working it out each time and and just building your level of confidence to know what the car's going to do at this time and when you put your input into it mm. cuz i guess like kind of that not kill that kind of first you go down that hill mm. chicane that is like when you first start doing that, you're like, like fucking Miss Daisy going yeah. down the track. Like, oh my God, this is scary. And mm -hmm. then by the end of it, you're like, when you actually watch a video yourself doing it, you're like, bloody hell. Like, yeah. it's quite, it's just your confidence obviously builds up. Mm -hmm. And talking about that, driving's, you know, escapism for a lot of people who are petrol heads and just a fan of motorsport. You know, I love taking my car out for a blast at weekends or getting on the country B road or something like that. But, um, in the same way that I do design for a living, to sit in front of a computer every weekend would drive me mad. Mm. Like, it's your job to drive. Do you still enjoy it when it's not yeah. when it's not work? Is yeah. it like your form of escapism, or do you have any other like um, sort of hobbies or stuff that you well, do I to don't get away enjoy from? Driving on the road. That's yeah. just it's just a, a tool to get from one place to the <laughs> other. Isn't it? I because I sit in the car all the time when I have to drive long drives on the the road. It's a pain in the ass, but yeah. it's got to be done. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of kind of escapism stuff, yes. Yeah, so, that's not really car related so um you know going on little road trips somewhere to like go um surfing mm. or you know, like we've just got back from australia at the start of this year oh, and wow. i learned to surf out there and you know go mountain biking and um do some like fun runs so like fitness and like tough yeah. mudders and that kind of stuff so um yeah I, anything that's kind of adrenaline i guess um having said that i did do a track day the other week um i was uh, hosting this track day for a friend of mine and um i was about to say because if you just unassumingly turned up to a random track day <laughs> everybody might be well pissed <laughs> no. off so, like, who the fuck is this person yeah Whizzing um, around us. <laughs> so he was basically hosting this track day and he had his lotus cortina there and oh. you know, he was like do you want to just go out for a drive and actually it was just fun to just turn up and have a little play and just yeah. not yeah, there's no pressure on times or anything. It was just going out to experience this lovely car. And, you know, my dad jumped in and had another go again. And we both jumped in together and it was just fun. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it because you don't, I don't do it enough. You I was know, about to say, all... like, is that like, because most times when you're on a track, you're probably either coaching someone mm. or actually trying to hit a time or yeah. shave yeah. off milliseconds off your time. Yeah. You know, there's pressure there on myself to like get this time or you know to qualify up the grid a bit more or blah yeah. blah um or if you're coaching someone you're just trying not to die and trying to get them to go quick whilst not killing you in the process um so to actually turn up and just yeah relax the environment was yeah it was nice and when you are trying like a hit a time like are you going through like a bit of a mental warfare with yourself and you just can't hit the time that you know you can hit but for some reason it's just not coming out there on track sometimes or? it's like that um you know sometimes you just can't string it together um it might just be that you know the the car the setup needs tweaking slightly or you need to you know go and maybe just have a little break and then approach it with a different mind but mm. um generally i can always kind of work myself to to get there eventually i kind of know myself well enough now that if i'm not performing you know if there's something i just need to go and have a word with myself or whatever but generally i know that like when i knuckle down i'll get the time um 
And it's just like, for example, the Jag at the weekend um, in qualifying two, I think I qualified like six, but there was like, if I had qualified or gone one tenth faster, then I would have been fourth again. So mm. um, but I just couldn't hook it up together. The car was just a little bit too sideways. And no matter how I drove it, I couldn't calm it down. Um, so we made a few tweaks before the race. And in the race, I was second fastest. I was quickest for majority of the race <laughs> until he picked my time at the end. So um, you, you learn what's you when you learn what's the car and a combination of the two as well that when it needs to change yeah and like for those of you who don't know that was the jagger i pace e trophy yeah catchy name uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what was it like driving an electric car that's a little bit quieter than a roaring mm. gt touring car whatever it may yeah. be is it a bit of a different experience because you don't have the engine noises and all this kind of stuff or yeah. is it quite bizarre to start off with it's a little bit weird um <laughs> you know you put your foot down and it's just and you're like, right, okay okay that's the noise i've got um but once you get stuck in it's a bit like as i mentioned before where you kind of go into this focused mode yeah you don't realize that there isn't any noise um the thing that's maybe a little bit strange is obviously if you you know change down a gear you you feel the engine breaking and you, you feel mm. that kind of stuff whereas with an electric car it's it's not yeah. um and also you don't get a tow from the car in front with an electric car so um for example at the weekend it, it was very 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 difficult to overtake because i'd get a really good run out of this corner onto a really long straight i'd close the gap up to the car in front but as soon as we're maxed out that's it you just sit behind each other um you know there's no mm -hmm. tour that you can get whereas obviously in an internal combustion engine yeah. you get that extra pull and you can use the the higher revs and so on so i would never have kind of considered yeah. that before so the car in front all they need to do is just defend and you either try and outbreak and go around the outside of them, which nine times out of ten is not going to yeah. work, or <laughs> you know, it, and it was it's quite so a big tight. car as well. Oh, they're huge, absolutely like, huge. Like when I saw it online, it was just like that feels like a really weird car to pick mm. to have a you know series around. I mean, it's good but, fun that it handles well, and mm. and I mean, ultimately, it is still a, it's just a road car, um, with you know operated suspension, and I mean, the brakes on it are fantastic considering mm. it's like two tons. This thing stops well. Um, but the track um, in uh, Riyadh is very tight and twisty, you know, street circuit, yeah. very, very narrow. Um, but it just meant that you, for one half of the track, you basically following the leader. And then the next half, you try and outbreak them um, and hope for the best. So, um, but that's just part of it. That's that's part of the, the, the kind of strategy kind of, you need yeah, to take yeah, when you're driving Yeah, just working out there. when to use your boost and, you know, when to overtake them and capitalize and when you can. Yeah, because that's a, like, you know, I've... I, I enjoy motorsport and I watch F1 and then when you get somebody maybe watching F1 with you that never watches it um, and you're actually talking about the strategy that they have to use whether it's pitting or you know whatever like I think a lot of people just think oh yeah the green light goes on and they just have a race it's mm. like it's not really quite as simple no, as that. There's lots, <laughs> lots involved. Like how much you know planning and strategy goes into a race for you on any kind of given series? Um. It depends if it's like a sprint race. So if it's like a 20 minute race, for example, then there's not really a lot other than you and the car mm. and, and reacting to the situations around you. Um, you know, you can always think, right, you know, if you start on the left of the grid, right, I'm going to try and get over to the right and undertake them there. But ultimately that might not happen in the race because someone else might block that. So you, you've always got to think on your feet from that. But the strategies kind of come in with the longer endurance races. So you know, for 24 hours, you've got X amount of pit stops and you might have damage and there might be a safety car and, mm. and that kind of stuff. So it's just picking when you do things and looking long term, you know, how much fuel can we put in the car and how much does that fuel uh, equate to in laps? And, you know, can we do a double stint if we can do two lots of fuel? And there's there's lots going into that kind of stuff. And you'll have a, a strategist that works yeah. on the team to maximize that and calculate and, all that stuff yeah yeah and in, in f1 you know it's super oh, super yeah. important um but yeah there, there are lots of kind of cogs working away to make it all happen yeah yeah uh obviously you are also a professional driving coach um is that you coaching other drivers who are looking to become professional or is that complete novices or is that a mixture of everyone mixture of everyone can take someone to... that's on the very first track day ever up to you know people that have raced for 10 
20 odd years it's yeah complete range of abilities do you enjoy one more than the other <laughs> um I think it's probably more rewarding with novices because you can take them from, you know, starting the start of the, the season with, you know, bundle of nerves and making lots of mistakes. And then actually at the end of the season, they might get their first win or something. And it's yeah. always nice to be part of that, you know, journey of building a foundation of someone. Um, when you get up to the higher levels, you know, obviously it's just fine tuning little things. And um, the reward is is there from having a consistent driver so you know they might go out and be in the top three whenever they're on track which mm. is you know fantastic feeling to to help that kind of stuff but I think um coaching kids is quite fun um because they come with no baggage <laughs> you know they've, they've not driven on the road for 20 30 years and yeah they haven't got any bad habits so they're they're a clean sheet if you like that you can you know get up to speed really quickly yeah and are there like kind of common bad habits people who just kind of you know, say I just um, came in or like some random goes gifted a, a coaching session with you. Not, there's not bad habits per se, but just not looking far enough ahead. Right. And that's just because you've never, or really you should look as far ahead on the road as you do on the track. But the difference is you might be approaching at 50 mile an hour, whereas on the track, your yeah. closing <laughs> speed is a lot faster and you need to be more prepared and look a lot further ahead than than what you might do on the road mm. um but that's just something that you, it comes with working at you know i still have to remind myself sometimes look ahead look further ahead especially if you're on a new circuit it's very easy to just look as close as you can in front of you and that's the worst thing you can do yeah. um <clears throat> but it's just natural you know you start to feel a bit anxious or a bit nervous or unsure of what's ahead you want to make sure that right in front of you are you you're using the right part and mm. you know that kind of stuff but yeah generally it's just vision and having confidence in the car um and just feeling what the car is doing which is just something that is only getting your bum in the seat that's yeah. how you're gonna learn it wow and uh in terms of exciting news, you mentioned earlier that you're going to be taking part in W Series in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a bit about, just in general, I suppose, the W Series, because a, a lot of people might not know about it, and kind of how it differs from some of the other races you've taken part in? Yeah, so W Series is the world's first kind of all-female single-seater championship, and um, it was set up, it was the first year this year, 2019, and it's basically the main aim is to try and uh, raise the profile of females in motorsport and to give females in motorsport a bit of a platform to learn on and experience. You know, the, the F3, F, F3 car is an extremely high level mm. of, of single seater yeah. and it's all fully funded as well. So you don't have to bring any budget to the table or anything like that. It's literally all paid for expenses, everything. And wow. um, you win a decent amount of money at the end of it as well. So... The whole reason for trying to do it is that, you know, we always get asked, why are there no females in F1? Or, <laughs> you know, why are there lack of the females and blah, blah, blah. And it's just a numbers game. You know, for every thousand men that like motorsport, there might be 10 women that are yeah. into it. And, you know, you look at the grid of F1, there's, what, 20 odd cars on the grid? And that is the entire world of motorsport that, that boils well, yeah, down to those 20. yeah, there's only one F1. Yeah. It's not like... like football where there's just yeah. multiple different like obviously you have different leagues in terms yeah. of like formula three and things like that but exactly. like it's not f1 it's happening enough, in america f1 happening in brazil there's yeah. like it's just one sort uh, one uh session a uh, series so. yeah and you know for for every yeah so let's say every thousand men you might get 10 20 of them that are good enough for f1 so for every 10 women you might only have one that's actually quick enough for f1 but she needs the money and she needs a bit of luck and ultimately you can the have the talent as well that you need as well do you there know is, yeah for super license points but we'll ignore that for now <laughs> but like if you don't have the money then you might have talent and you might have luck but ultimately you need money to do it so this is what w series are trying to do is just kind of create the opportunities for the for the females to do it um initially i was uh skeptical about it as i think the majority of the world probably was um just because there'd been some other kind of female only championships in the past that you know they've been a bit of a flop and they've not really worked mm -hmm. and they've almost been a bit of a gimmick and um you know w series just seemed too good to be true uh you know not bringing any money and winning loads of money at the end of it <laughs> yeah. um 
I'd kind of worked quite hard to go down the Australian V8 supercar route. And, mm, you know, the, the previous year before that, I'd put my heart and soul into trying to get that together. And I'd never raced single seaters before. And so to me, to kind of do that would be a massive, like, deviation away from what I was trying to do. So sure. I just decided to sit and watch the first year happen and just see, you know, what it was like. And I would concentrate on doing what I was doing. and you know, thankfully, the W Series have invested the money in the right places. They've gone about it in the right way, and it's been run very professionally. So, you know, this year's come around, and I've said, right, you know, I'll apply for it and and see if I can give it a go. Because ultimately, I would just be sat on my ass doing that a lot. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to have a go and, and get involved. Yeah, in terms of like that kind of application process, then is it like again any your is it points is it just race history you know how for how did they choose who gets the, the spots um so you basically apply so you put an application form in and it basically says you know your race history and what you aspire to do and blah 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 mm. and they look through the applications and then i think there was like 16 of us that got invited to um almeria which is a track in spain and basically there was a testing program put in right, place. Okay. So over the three days, you'd have two 20 minute, uh, 20 lap runs um, over the days and basically just see how you got on with the car and how you progressed and lap times and how you interacted with your engineers and media and all that jazz. So um, it wasn't just about, you know, pure lap times, even though obviously that was yeah. quite important. Because um, I want like, you know, people who are actually marketable, I suppose, yeah. as well. Yeah. They do. I mean, if I someone's shy away from a camera, no. you see one and things like yeah. that. But it's just looking for the full package, really. Mm. And, you know, the whole point of it is is to act as a bit of a feeder series. And if they've got someone that, you know, might be quick, but can't talk to people and talk to the media, then they, they you know, that's a neg likeable, negative point. You know? like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a intense three days. Yeah, how was that um, kind of test drive over in Spain then getting in? To the car for interesting the first time. <laughs> uh you know i've never raced single seaters so um obviously you know it's four wheels on the ground you've got a steering wheel in front of you and if you're a quick driver you can drive anything but it's um a completely different technique to drive mm. those cars and i had to learn a lot and um i enjoyed the challenge and the girls there were lovely and the team were really nice um and obviously i didn't do too bad if i got picked yeah um <laughs> But yeah, it it was uh, an eye opener for um, you know a different form of driving. But I'm just excited to get stuck in next year and not have to worry about budget and and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the main thing I'm trying to do at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, is just get some money to get to go testing. Yeah, exactly. Um, but if I don't do that, then whatever, I'll just <laughs> learn on the job and we'll, we'll be just there by the end of the year. Just makes it even more impressive yeah. if you if you if you do well. I just have to dig deep. Is it like televised? Yeah, so it's on Channel 4. Is um, it? So last year awesome. the race was um, on the Saturdays, which I think is going to be the same again next year. Yeah. Um, so it's usually about like 2 p.m. on Saturday uh, on the race weekends. Nice. Uh, that's the one thing that I'm kind of like gutted. I know like Channel 4 does show some F1, but mm -hmm. like I refuse to pay for a Sky. Yeah. Sky well, the Sky in general, because the only thing I would watch on it is F1 probably. Yeah. But maybe I'll bite the bullet one day. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, it kind of uh, goes without saying that obviously motorsport is very male dominated. And, you know, I've listened to a ton of, and read a ton of interviews with yourself where, you know, I don't know, there was one on YouTube that I was watching. And it's almost like the people are almost kind of, I don't know, like begging you to kind of like talk shit about it. But then you kind of, on the contrary to it, it's like, yeah, I've not really had that many problems. Yeah, you get the odd prick going around mm -hmm. the track or something like that he's just got an ego or something like this but on the yeah. whole it's not actually as bad as probably what people think um you know especially in this kind of day and age when everyone's looking to blame someone for something or kind yeah. of kick off about something how much of it is like that just like the media just like hunting for like a juicy story versus like how much have you actually had to deal with on your way up like i think there's probably if i think it depends what situation you're in as to how you deal with maybe people's comments um you know i guess i'm quite thick-skinned um but i just i'm just there to race i mm. don't care about what people's opinions are if they want me there or not i don't care like i'm there and i'm i'm gonna be trying to be the fastest yeah, um yeah. 
you know, back in the day when I was karting, it was probably, there was probably more of it back then. Yeah. Um, but it would be, you know, mechanics saying, you're not going to let a girl beat you, are you? Or, you know, and, and you do sometimes get that now, but I, I just think it's funny. Like, yeah. it's great because... <laughs> like, you know, why would it, it make any difference? Well, no, because it is. And even my dad's the same. He's like, you know, even though you're my daughter, I still wouldn't want a girl beating me. And and it is, it's, you know, it's it's an adrenaline thing. It, it's, He's like, dad's you know, never changed. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, fear and being brave and, you know, that is all what kind of I Probably guess a bit men more motivation entail. for you to actually do well. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. well, fuck these guys. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't like because as soon as they say something like that, I'm like, I, I don't think any less of them or anything like that. I'd be like, I'd be the same. Like, I don't want to be the, like a, a girl to be quicker than me. Like, mm. you know, I want to be the quickest girl. Um, so I can understand why they might make a few comments, but, um, you know, majority of girls that are actually good don't care they're just there to get yeah. on with it and to win it and um it seems like a pretty professional sport in that sense like you know other than like when you get i don't know either in footballers or you get like you watch like you know i'm really into the ufc and there's all this like trash talking and all this kind of stuff but yeah. just to kind of help build hype and motorsport as far as to my limited knowledge doesn't seem to really have that it's kind of more people are just kind of focused on yeah getting on the track and doing a good job mm. well, your, your stuff the build up to it is your previous results and I think probably when I first started and definitely actually when I do if I go into a new championship where maybe people don't know me then the drivers will always be more harsh with me on track and try and like push me off or try and hit me off like I did a one-off race in the Alpine A110 Cup this year and they were all on mainly French drivers and probably a lot of them didn't know who I was mm. and with it being a one-off drive you know I just jumped in and I somehow like, I think put it fourth or third on the grid for quality wow. and they were just like you know who is this but in the races <laughs> they just they just kept hitting me they just kept hitting me off and um you know I said to the the kind of race director I was like it's just normal I was like mm. you know they'll try and outdrive me and the only way that they can try and get past me is by hitting me and the difference is I'm not intimidated. I won't move. You know, if there's a car trying to move over and push me off the track, I'll just sit there. I'll be like, yeah. well, hit into me then because I can't go any further off the circuit because I'll be on the grass. So the only person that's actually making any move towards someone is you to me. Yeah. And when they realize that they're not going to intimidate me, then they stop doing it. Um, so that's maybe the only thing. But it's probably the same no matter if you're a guy or a girl. If you're a new person in a championship, then that is what you're going to deal with. Um do you get stewards and stuff like kind of dealing with situations like that in those kind of championships? Or is it just kind of like a bit like karting where it's like don't hit each other, but if it happens and don't cry about it either? Like, um, It depends on if someone's obviously gone and hit someone off, then they'll hmm. be penalized. But I've had it where some stewards are um, on the side of maybe this, the nationality of the drivers, oh, right, yeah. if they're the same nationality. Um but most stewards are very fair and they're very good at what they do. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I really don't think there's been a lot of issue. I yeah. think the media maybe do look for stories and there maybe is, maybe I've just been lucky that I've not really dealt with anything like that. Um, you know, I guess the one thing that is different and probably drives all the media stories about, you know, the different kind of sexist comments or whatever is that, you know, I had someone say to me the other day, and quite he was quite a high boss of something, and <laughs> he basically said, "Well, you know, you biologically you haven't got much time left, you know, to be a driver." And I was like, I, "I was like, this could be several ways. It could be saying that because I'm I'm a female, that I'm not as strong as a guy, or that because I might want kids, or well, yeah, that's what I thought. Age. You meant, like, like there's there's lots of ways to look at it. And I thought, well, whoa, I'll give him the benefit like... of the doubt, and I'll just say." you know well women just have to train a bit harder than men or you know whatever but you know this well, i'm sure maybe somewhat goes through your minds obviously but like why would he and it, well, it surprised pretty me when fucking he said bold it. to yeah. go out there and say it out I, loud i looked at him and was like did you did that just actually come out of your mouth <laughs> but you know it was you just whatever i'm not yeah. really bothered again you know give me the opportunity it reflects and I'll more be... than them than it does on you yeah. so yeah. yeah yeah just as you say brush it off your shoulders yeah. and probably if anything's kind of giving you a thicker skin as you say yeah i just give him the bees and away i went <laughs> <laughs> mentally Brilliant. very professional and everything yeah I do, of course obviously. uh as i mentioned uh in the intro like a lot of people obviously know you from being the test driver on the grand tour um 
how did that opportunity kind of present itself? Was that another test <laughs> uh, where you kind of had to jump in and kind of, you know, hit a certain time? And, you know, was that, again, something that an application goes up for and you have to apply for it? Or did it kind of come towards you from your kind of work in racing? Um, it was kind of, I was headhunted, basically. Right. And there was, I think it was probably like 20 of us that went up um, to to have the opportunity. And um, basically, we went to the circuit and there was like five cars lined up. And it was right, do the lap, oh, go around, see if you can get close to this lap time. And yeah, ended up. And did you know what it was for at this point? Yeah. No, so they wouldn't tell me, but I kind of guessed what it was for. <laughs> they were, it was a bit obvious. They just said it was, you know, in case a there was a new car show. Yeah. That's not called. And top I knew year. it would be for the Grand Tour. Oh, right. Okay. Um, but they basically said they might do a feature on on maybe a girl in in it for the next year or something like that. But you know, I was I was like, well, why am I doing timed laps around the track? That and they were like, well, you know, just if we have a race, we obviously want to know that you can keep up. And I was thinking that is bullshit. I know what this is for. <laughs> um, but yeah, I ended up, you know, smashing the times and all the cars that are done. And then they invite me back for um, like a morning uh, session with, I think we had like a Porsche 911 or something. And again, you know, a bit quicker cars yeah. and same process. And then um, I had all the cameras on me, all the, you know, I had to maybe talk, I think I talked to camera a little bit and just to see what I was like interacting with people and if I was actually comfortable on camera. And then um, was invited down to the Grand Tour office, which is in London, and basically sat down with Andy Willman and he said, right, you know, we're, we are going to sack the American and we want you to be the driver. You know, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, we're like, cool. <laughs> oh, cool give opportunity. Go. Yeah, Why not? You know, of course I do. Um, <laughs> and then that's just kind of how it happened. Wow. So, yeah. Pretty so cool. how, like, from that kind of meeting to you, you know, doing your first kind of appearance, how long was that? like in between um i think it was like a couple of months all right so not long at all then no yeah maybe a month a couple of months in fact yeah i think it was a month because we had to rush it in because then i was going away traveling for a bit all right so i was like if i do it i've kind of got to do it now yeah no before i go uh i can't remember if it was the first episode you were in or just one of the first ones where you're taking the merc around the mm -hmm. ebola drum mm-hmm yeah, is that right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, and you can kind of like hear yourself say like, right, here we go. Was that more just like a, because it's your first time on the show or because it's like, a, was it the first test lap you did or did you do a few or was it just, you know, did you even, were you even aware that you're kind of saying it to yourself until you saw it on TV? <laughs> it was 100% scripted. All right. Spoiler. <laughs> um, basically, I think it was to do with... Um, Obviously, the stig didn't say anything. Yeah. And I think they were probably just trying to play it safe by getting me to speak so that I wasn't too stig-like. Yeah, yeah. So, actually, this was done probably after. probably some, like, legal stuff there yeah. with stig. Yeah. which is why I think once they realized it was all good, then the, the third series, they didn't make me say any shit, any cringy, <laughs> cringy lines. Uh, we did have a Could giggle. Could be worse, like, with TV producers. Yeah. You never know what they'll get you to come out with. Oh, so. We did have a laugh doing them. But I basically got a phone call while I was traveling, and it was like, look, we need to get you to say some lines. So, they were actually recorded in a sound recording studio in hong kong and then put on over the top oh well so you you can see i'm getting like in some of them i'm really emotive i'm like yeah let's do it and my eyes are just like okay glazed over because i'm not actually saying it um oh, well. but yeah there you go spoiler well, yeah hashtag spoiler alert <laughs> exclusive probably not i'm sure you probably said it in another interview but um, <laughs> i don't know if i'm allowed to say it but there you go. Oh, well. Exclusive. Shit happens. Yeah. I don't think it'll come to any surprise I think it's pretty that obvious. some bits of TV are scripted. Yeah. Um, uh, if you, <laughs> I mean, Top Gear in itself is uh, a very scripted show. Well, it's kind of, especially with the Grand Tour, then they are really not that scripted. You know, they've got a well, storyline that they want to do, the... or maybe they want to think, oh, that might be fun to do that or whatever. But actually, like, everything that they say is all normal like all natural well and it's like the transcripts at the end of it are like full and yeah the poor guys have to actually go through it all i and... know well it's like one of these things that that's like it's why the new top gear is never going to be successful mm. like it's those three guys that make it what it is yeah. and their attitudes to one another yeah. 
like just sticking a few celebrities together is never going to make a successful show. No. Like, and that's why the American one was never hugely successful either because they didn't mm. have the same relationship as those guys, you know? No. Um, you know, it's lightning in a bottle and you're not going to be able to capture it no. time and time again. I think, like, I've watched the most recent Top Gear, the first episode of it, and I think, you know, Freddie and, um, was it Chris and what's the other one? Oh, uh, yeah, I've forgotten his name. Freddie and my brother and I were just talking about this the other day as well. I can't remember, but the three boys, anyway, I think yeah. their, their chemistry is a lot better. Um, but for me, I just always feel like they're just trying to copy yeah. you know, the real boys. Don't and, call it Top Gear for starters, it's, call it something else yeah. and then just have a motor show. Yeah. But, but yeah. I can understand why you know the BBC want to do it because it was so successful and you know, there's still a lot of people watch it and they love it. Yeah. So I, you know, I think if it's still popular, then you know, keep at means. it. But um, you know, I grew up watching the boys on TV and... Yeah, it's so funny because I remember like back in VHS days, uh, you know, like every Christmas or birthday, that I now know that it's pretty. My dad bought us it just so he could watch them, yeah. but it was disguised as a gift for us. But it'd mm. be like one of Jeremy Clarkson's like, you know, hyper cars or whatever it is. Yeah, and it's just like it seems like such an alien concept to actually. That was basically one episode mm. of Top Gear. Yeah, but it only came out like once a year. And yeah, it's just like now you could. Just whatever. Look at how many gazillion people on YouTube are doing car reviews about the yeah. same car, and you can probably learn everything you need to know about the car before you even buy it. Mm. But yeah, it's funny how it's changed. Good old VHS. Mm. Uh, how much of an effect has appearing on that show had? I mean, like, well, judging by the listener questions, <laughs> I don't know if that happened prior to the show, but mm -hmm. you had a, a lot of people commented, and you've obviously got quite a large following as well. Has it affected, like, I can imagine it's obviously affected your professional life, but your personal life as well? Um, it's not really affected my personal life too much. Um, just in terms of kind of the opportunities that I've had have been obviously a lot, lot more uh, coming from it. Mm. Um, you know, ideally when I got the job, I was thinking, oh, I might actually get a full time drive out of this now. Yeah. And that hasn't happened. So, um, <laughs> yeah, great. Um, but I've, you know, I've had the opportunity to race, um, the European Rallycross this year. And that was, you know, off the back of, you know, me having a little bit of a following and, you know, the other uh, guest drives that I've had have, have been probably mm. from the, the following that I have. So, you know, really, really positive impact from that. Um, Maybe help with like sponsors as well? Or nope. No? <laughs> no, I still haven't got any money. Yeah. Um, you know, still no budget to go racing. Um, otherwise, I would be testing for W Series. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's been very positive, but um, yeah. Uh, you would have preferred maybe to have another year with with the the boys doing it in the format that they sure. they've done the previous years. But yeah, overall very positive, and it's it's you know giving me a following that I can use to promote my stuff and and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are they as kind of silly and idiotic as they appear on TV? Um, to a degree. Or, or do they kind of play it up? They they do play it up a little bit. Can on imagine, TV. like Clarkson probably is because he just seems to like be a bit of like an actual entertaining person yeah i mean they're, they're all lovely guys and um you know they're, they're very good especially jeremy at kind of saying things for a reaction on tv you know he's, he's not stupid he knows how yeah. to create a star <laughs> and to create publicity and so on um you know, james mays is really really funny he's a really really genuine guy and yeah. um yeah really he's very witty and he's got a good sense of humor and same with with richard really caring guy you know he's always he's very much a family oriented guy mm. and um yeah they were all first time i met them they all came over and had a little chat with my mum and dad and stuff so um yeah really yeah. nice because yeah, i really like kind of what they're doing with drive tribe and stuff as well and like it just seems such a natural thing for them to have basically their own channel on youtube i know mm. they've obviously got the grand tour which is a huge huge production huge show but like just, you know, sitting with Clarkson outside a pub is just like that's such a natural thing for them to do that I can imagine that a lot of people would so no wonder it's been a success basically. Mm. Um like when like anyone else launched something like that, it'd probably fall flat on its fucking yeah. face. But they or just had people to be are interested in them and yeah, what they're doing exactly. and, and their opinion on things. And if they post about it, then people want to look and see, well, why have they posted about it? So yeah, it's just all really on the back of the the three boys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, Hammond himself is not shy of a near-death experience. And, you know, you're driving really fast round tracks and, you know, 
you can have really scary experiences and obviously tragic ones like Jules Bianchi and things like that. Um, who have sadly, or even like I watched the Billy Munger documentary mm. a couple of weeks ago and I fucking leapt out my seat when you actually yeah. see the footage of that happening. It's so mm. scary. Um, does that ever affect you as a driver? Does it ever creep into your mind if you have like a scary moment and do you ever kind of suffer from the anxiety of it all? Or does it kind of, if it, if you were that kind of person, you wouldn't probably be racing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think racing drivers are a little bit of a weird bunch. Um, <clears throat> you know, actually the cars <laughs> and the circuits that are the most scary and challenging, they're usually the ones that like we thrive on the most. Mm. Um, you know, when you see crashes, you know, for example, like the Billy Monger crash, you do kind of, it just hits home as to actually we're not all invincible. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we are lucky to do what we do and you have to respect the track. You have to respect the the drivers that are around you. And sometimes I think we can probably forget about that. Whereas I think, you know, MotoGP riders, I think their level of respect for each other is extremely oh, huge because they are so vulnerable. And I think... Hey, it's in, petrifying when you watch yeah, MotoGP. I love watching like, them. Uh, no, it's, just it's, insane, it's, aren't they? it's one of the best racing you could ever watch because yeah. there's just so much always happening. Um, and it's not... Yeah, there are a couple of front runners, but you know like it, you can always just keep watching it mm. uh but when you think like that is just like they don't have a car to no. protect there's no shell no it's just like you're you're still a man on a They're bike a missile <laughs> like, like, like you know you're still a person hour. on a bike yeah it's not uh there's not really too much to protect you there no and when you see them just like fly off and some of them just walk off mm. it's just like fucking hell that's yeah. petrifying respect but, to them for sure yeah. um but yeah you don't really you don't really think about it to be honest um mm. you know there might be somewhere especially on like street tracks you think right if i fuck this up like it's gonna hurt so make sure that you're precise yeah. um but when you see some yeah. of the street tracks it's like i always remember this from again watching wrc and there's this like there's a fucking <laughs> a piece of string with two posts and like people are like leaning over and yeah. the car's like three feet away or from some them. spectators from on the rally stages <sighs> are stupid and they don't realize actually that they can negatively affect the driver's well, head yeah. and i just think yeah that you, go on the inside of a corner if you're going to go watch go on the inside of a corner mm. because nine times out of ten if something goes wrong you're not going to get hit but you know nine times out of ten if you're on the outside of the corner you're going to cause the driver to go slower because yeah. he doesn't want to hit you if anything goes wrong so um yeah pretty, crazy pretty, pretty scary, scary stuff mm. uh just to kind of wrap up we'll move on to listener questions i say wrap up there's quite a lot of questions <laughs> so i like i kind of do this for every episode but certainly has been the most amount of questions I've received yeah. in the shortest amount of time. Yeah. Uh, and I've kind of blocked out some of the weird ones. So hopefully we can cover them all. So, and again, my God, completely global as well. Four corners of the world kind of getting in touch. But Clem from Brisbane has asked, when will we see you racing in Oz again? I'm, I would love to go back as soon as possible. <laughs> I love Australia. It is one of the best places I've ever, what well, is the best place I've ever been to. And, um, I loved the V8 supercars that are out there. Obviously, I did the one-off round at the start this year in Adelaide, and it didn't quite go to plan. There was kind of stuff that happened behind the scenes that, mm. that um, hindered the full weekend, really. But, yeah, I would love to go and have another go at it and just give it a proper shot and do a full season. So, obviously, now I've got the W Series kind of um, focus. Um, if something came up where I had an opportunity to do the V8 supercars again and it would work side by side with W Series, then awesome. 100% I'd do it. But yeah, if not, my, my focus is on W Series at the moment. Cool. Uh, Joel Sitzlein, who was a guest on episode 13 of the podcast, mm -hmm. shout out to Joel, uh, all the way from San Fran. Uh, I was going to kind of ask you about this anyway because I've always been kind of interested in it, but um, I'll let him answer the question. But mm. how do racing drivers kind of stay in top physical shape um, or, you know, how much he was just kind of curious about the actual physical challenges on your body and like you know obviously you are sitting down and you're going around the track but it's absolutely exhausting mm. and most racing drivers are all in fantastic shape and you know amazing endurance and cardio so you know how do you condi condition yourself for a race you just have to be as fit as possible like no no stone and turn basically and <clears throat> you'll see a lot of drivers doing you know triathletes uh triathlons and and that kind of stuff because you know 
you are sat yeah you are sat down in or you're in a seating position but the g forces that are mm. on your body and you know the physical exertion you have to do to actually drive the car is huge and especially if you're doing an endurance race where you might be sat in the car for an hour and a half it's constant and you know, for example if you were to lay on this table here and hang your head off the end of the table and you have to kind of lift up against and just your own body weight of, of your head yeah you know, then imagine someone putting 20 kilograms on the side of your head and doing that for x <laughs> amount of time That's you know crazy. it's when you break it down and think about it like that, people are like, oh, wow, yeah, you know, it actually is quite physical because what they expect is how it feels like to drive your car on the road and it's yeah. nothing like that. And, you know, you add in the um, temperature of, of certain cars. Um, and certain countries as well. Yeah, when I was racing in Adelaide, it was 42 degrees and the inside oh of the car was 75 degrees. God. And I was sat in it with... 41 you know, degrees. 42 42, 42 that extra one so you know you sat in the car which is all you know engine in front of you hot air is coming back yeah. in you've got one layer on underneath which is your fireproof layer and then you have your racing suit on top and you have a helmet and you have a balaclava and blah 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 so you can't actually sweat properly and um you know you'll lose oh two three kilograms of, of i don't want to walk to my car in 42 degrees never yeah. mind racing one and it's when your body starts to get heat exhaustion your mind goes, so you mm. have to be as physically fit as possible so that you can smash those lap times out every single time. Um, and, you know, at the end of it, it's all about your recovery as well. And mm. and even before that, actually, you know, the week before, you need to be really hydrated. And you know, I was going to ask about that because obviously in like F1 and stuff, they're constantly taking in water and things like that because they've got it on board with them. But like in some... I bet they don't drink a lot of it while they're racing. Well, I can imagine it'd probably be quite a distraction. No? Mm. And, and it's usually awkward. hot by that time. Uh, yeah, very lukewarm water. Mm. Um, I can imagine some of the races you've probably done, you don't even have that luxury, even if you did want it. Mm. So, like, how much kind of, like, water weight are you losing just through sweat? Yeah, like two, three kilograms, maybe oh. in one race. Um, you know, you, That's so much. In the build-up to it, you have to almost saturate your body with water. So if you just don't drink all, or you drink average amount of water during the week, and then on the Friday, you like binge yeah. you know, three, four litres of water, it'll just come straight out of you. So yeah, the week before, you, like have flushing, just, yeah. you have to just keep at it and just make sure you're really, really topped up with, with fluids, um, just because you will lose it while you're driving. You know, you're never going to be able to replenish as quick as you lose it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, Richard asks, what is your dream series to be a driver in? Um, again, V8 Supercars, I think, is still something that I'd love to do. Um, you know, it's very niche, I think. Uh, probably the the world, if you're not into motorsport, you might not know a lot about it. If you, mm. you know, just a Joe Bloggs, just watching, sure. you know, F1 when it's on the TV. But it's the best racing. I think the, the drivers are so, so talented and the cars are so difficult to get the most out of. Um, but in general, you know, I, my goal ever since I was younger was to be a works driver for a manufacturer and, you know, whether that would be, you know, racing for Bentley in GT3 or racing for, you know, Audi in DTM or yeah. something like that. It was just, I would, I would want to drive for a manufacturer in some form of motorsport. Yeah. Do you have a favorite manufacturer that you would love to dream one? No, I like them all equally <laughs> and I would like them all to one of them to give me a drive. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully one of them's listening that would be yeah. amazing um, uh, where am I sorry going down the list Warren from Alberta Canada asks if you could build your perfect car what body chassis engine transmission <laughs> brakes would you build from any combination of make and manufacture oh my god fuck's sake that's a hard question I'm you one of these drivers just... I, do you know what I love driving I hate cars <laughs> sorry guys um <laughs> So I think start off with I have a big V8 in it, nice V8, proper, you know, don't want any turbos or anything like that, just a standard, normally aspirated V8. Um, I would have some big fuck off brakes on it and um, probably big your tires. most important thing if you've got a good V8 yeah. <laughs> is that you've been able to stop the fucking yeah. thing. Um, and I don't really know in terms of kind of chassis and, and body on it. Um, Do you have like a kind of you know, five car garage, like that it changes would... all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really know. Hard question. Just some, I think in terms of visually, it doesn't really matter, but the internal gubbins, mm. are, you know, I'd, I'd want 
probably a sequential box in it. Um, yeah, V8, big old brakes, just a, a big old thing. Yeah. That's probably just because, you know, I grew up watching my dad drive V8 Euro cars and he's got um, an Australian touring car from the 80s. So we oh, wow. he imported that um, across it. So a Bathurst replica um, of Peter Brock. So that is, yeah, cool. V8, 550 brake, hitch pattern box, big, heavy, chunky thing. And they just look sick. So something like that, I think. Yeah, it's all this, like, you know, talks of noise silencers coming in by 2020 and all this kind of stuff it's so the fucking fun sponges of the world but you go to europe and you know the louder the better well yeah and it's just someone moves next to a track and they're like actually it's quite loud yeah you know and then they get get banning put in place i just think it's just a culture unfortunately that you know british people are not as passionate about motorsport as you know the italians and yeah stuff like that I like we the missus and I were in Bologna a while back and it was just like a oh, Bologna, wow, get to visit, you know, Lamborghini and all this mm. stuff. Went in August, it's all fucking closed. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's only shut down in August. I was like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh I have no idea to pronounce this thing, so I'm sorry. Kusai Q U S A I. Kusai. Kusai. Uh from Seattle asks, how was the Diria hashtag rider seasoned experience? And hospitality besides the Jagger I Pace e trophy? Um, it, it was quite interesting. First time I've been to Saudi Arabia, and um, is the temperature okay? Yeah, it was quite cold for that time of year. It was like between 16 and 19 degrees. Right. Um, oh, cold in the morning, cold in the evening. Um, but yeah, the hospitality was fantastic. You know, everyone was very um, helpful, really polite, and you know, there was always the kind of worry. Or, you know, you get cultural training before you go out there. Wow, that, it's bit, like, uh, my know, next follow-up question to that yeah. was, how was it with that, to that regard? It was all fine. You know, they're, they're probably they scare you a little bit more than what they need to. But, um, you know, as long as you're respectful to the culture that's out there and, um, you know, you, you kind of play by their rules, which is, is fine, um, then there's no hassle whatsoever. And there's been a big push this last year to try and um, make it more of a kind of tourist-friendly place. Mm. And... Yeah, you kind of you are in your own little world within the kind of Formula E paddock. It's very yeah. you know westernized and that kind of stuff. But yeah, everyone was really really polite. Food was great. You know, thanks to Jaguar for obviously having me and and providing me with all that. And um, yeah, I would you know not hesitate to go back and race again next year. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, Amira Sud from Iran has asked: Is twenty eight years old too late to start being a racing driver as a career? Um, I think it depends what career you're trying to go down. Uh, if you are trying to get into F1, then yes, I would say it's probably a little bit too late. Um, depends how big your bank balance is, though, yeah. and how quick you can, um, you know, you can get in. If you're the son of a billionaire, it. then your quid's yeah. in, is it? Um, but I think if you wanted to do it for fun, then yes, you know, get stuck in. You're never too old to try. Um, in terms of a career, probably 28 is maybe a little bit too late. Um, just because you have so much to learn, the foundations on on what you're doing. Um, but just in terms of the people yeah. you're going to be competing against, it doesn't even have to be driving. It could be boxing. It could be yeah. anything. You've got like just you know, hours on the track or hours in the ring or mm-hmm. hours on the pitch. Like people are just going to have more than you. So and your body like takes a beating in cars. You know, 16 mm-hmm. year olds they can bounce right back up, but yeah, you know, when you get in into your 30s, you start to creak a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very quick question that jeffrey has asked heel toe or trail braking they're two totally different things um i saw that <laughs> I know on what the heel comments. Toe is. i don't know what trail baking is so <laughs> your heel and toe is basically when you try and match the revs yeah. of the gear that you're going down to select so that you don't lock the rears so it just keeps the car stable um trail braking is when you kind of keep a little bit of brake pressure on as you're turning into the corner and all you do is basically the grip of a car is determined as to where the weight is. So while you're braking, the front of the, the car goes down. And um, the more that you're, the front of the car is, is being squished into the floor, then yeah. the more grip the front of the car is going to have. Sure. So um, it just aids with getting the car to turn in. Or if you want the rear of the car to kind of snap around a little bit, then then that's what you do. But yeah, they're two totally different things for totally different outcomes. Yeah. There you go. Learn something so new. Neither. <laughs> yeah. Both. I'll use both. Uh, <laughs> and quite a few people have asked, uh, possibly unsurprisingly, and I'm sure you've answered this question a gazillion times, but if you were offered a seat in F1, would you take it and who would you want as your teammate? 
Um, if I was offered a seat in F1, that would be totally crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, if I had the infrastructure around me to actually do it. Imagine and, getting that phone call. Yeah, like, I'd be like, you have to laugh. <laughs> you know, to do it and to be successful, um, then yes, obviously I would I would say yes. But um, yeah, a teammate with me, you know, Lewis Hamilton, mm. yeah, it's got to be Lewis because, you know, he is the best on the grid in my opinion and you know to learn off someone like that would be a fantastic opportunity um yeah. but yeah i think i can i would love up. it to be like you know i love that netflix season that was on about the f1 because you actually got to see like all the shit that goes on mm. behind closed doors and yeah. i think we should do that every year because it made it way more exciting this year for me mm. because you're just like you actually got all the kind of gossip and kind of yeah you know cattiness of some of the teams mm. going on yeah uh, and you like appreciated what like Haas have to go through because mm. they just don't have the same budget as yeah. you know Mercedes and stuff but uh so yeah we we'll hope, hope it's a bit more of a competitive or gets more competitive mm. new car shapes look pretty interesting yeah that's cool well. isn't it so it's kind mm. of slimmer tires and stuff anyway Abby thank you very much for coming to the show that's it's all right. been an absolute pleasure and appreciate you taking the time out of your rainy Thursday. It's <laughs> all right. I don't mind. Thanks for coming down. Uh, where can people find you online and on social and stuff and find out more about you? So um, I'm predominantly on Instagram and my um, handle is Abby Eaton 44 uh, Twitter is Abby Eaton 44 as well. And my Facebook is Abby Eaton Racing. Um, if you go on my website, abbyeaton.com, the kind of contact details are all on there. But yeah, I kind of update my social media pretty regularly. So head on there if you have any questions or anything. Obviously, you know, feel free to message. But that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you very much. No worries. So to wrap up, folks, head over to the website, the mitmpodcast.com to find out more about the show. Head over to your favorite podcast platform, hit subscribe, follow, whatever it may be, and that will get you notified when a new episode goes up. If you are enjoying the show, by all means, hit the stars, leave a review, fire a tweet out, share it with your friends, send a carrier pigeon to someone, whatever you may want to do. It helps grow the show. Um, and also, please get in touch. You know, we had lots of listener questions today. <laughs> Thanks to Abby's, uh, you know, loyal following. Uh, but always keen to hear from everyone. So, you know, fire me a tweet, get in touch via the email address method in the madness podcast at gmail.com and don't be shy get in touch but anyway that's it from us here thank you very much for listening and i hope you found some method in the madness <laughs>